And let me take this opportunity to welcome, I'll, I'll say all of you, uh, in this installment of uh, our monthly webinars, uh, as we've indicated uh, in the past three webinars that we've had, uh, that uh, we will be running these uh, monthly series webinars. Uh, where we started uh, really in 2023 with uh, professionalization of local government, but uh, looking in the main on how do we then look at uh, reviewing uh, the curriculum. Uh, and our second webinar was more around planning and budgeting, uh, and which I think uh, as we are having national treasury uh, in this webinar of today, uh, those are some of the collabs uh, we might have in future. Uh, and thirdly, we're really looking at uh, leadership, uh, but more uh, at a personalized uh, level. Uh, what is uh, personal leadership? Uh, with all uh, that, uh, it is uh, to welcome you and also to just give you a brief of where we are coming from uh, with these uh, webinars and of course, uh, thank you, Dan uh, and Tim uh, at uh, the Fisher Cities Africa. Uh, without you, honestly, uh, we will not be having uh, these webinars. And of course, uh, our team uh, from the Municipal Edge uh, for putting uh, these webinars together, working closely with Dan to ensure that uh, we create uh, this platform. Uh, but most importantly, uh, also our partners uh, that we are traveling this journey with, uh, that uh, being the Chartered Institute of uh, Government Finance, uh, Audit and Risk Officers, uh, which is SECFARO, as well as uh, the South African uh, Local Government uh, Association, uh, that is SALGA. Uh, it's all thanks uh, to that teamwork, uh, it's all thanks to those collaborations uh, because uh, as we are saying, uh, throughout uh, this year, we are looking at how do we then take the conversations where we often have uh, to actual uh, implementation. Uh, hence, uh, we are moving from ideation, uh, we've done that a lot, uh, to actions. But today is not about uh, all that background. Uh, it's about focusing uh, on a specific topic because we have had uh, reforms uh, in South Africa, specifically within the municipal space. Uh, but one of uh, the greatest, personally, I would say, uh, having uh, served uh, in the public service, uh, having uh, been there when the municipal standard chart of accounts uh, was born, I can put it that way. Uh, we have come a, lo a long way, uh, but one of the questions uh, remain uh, how far we've gone and how far we must still go. Uh, it is for that reason uh, we've got our panelists uh, today uh, who will really lay the basis of uh, this conversation and also how do we then take the conversation forward. Uh, I, I'll take uh, our lead presenter, Sustina from uh, National Treasury. I, I won't even introduce you. I, I will allow you uh, to introduce yourself uh, just before you, you lay the basis for the conversation, uh, just giving us your, your brief background. Uh, but most importantly, thanks for blessing us with your presence and thanks to National uh, Treasury uh, for allowing you uh, to be part of this conversation uh, this morning. Uh, let me hand over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zolani. I did not get your last name correctly. Mm, good morning, everyone who is present. I hope I am audible. Um, my name is Tina Nagy. I am from the National Treasury. I am a technical advisor for MSCOA, which is the Municipal Standard Chart of Accounts. I have been invited today to uh, talk about where exactly we are in terms of implementing the reform, which is MSCOA. I have prepared a presentation from my side so that I can go through it in explaining exactly where we are. But before I can um, explain where we are, I had to lay a foundation as to where 
uh, was and how was it birthed. So I am going to share my screen now so that um, I can discuss with you uh, the MSCO implementation. I will prefer to just stop my video at this point so that I can uh, be able to share my presentation and um, rather focus on the presentation. So basically today, um, I hope my, you can see my screen. These are the questions where I will not go through them in one by one that were posed. And basically my presentation will be based on this type of questions, the current state of the implementation of the business reform. And I was intentional to say business reform rather than the finance reform. I will talk to that um, at a later stage because initially when MSCOA started, um, there were people that were resisting the change. It was only looked at it um, as a finance reform. This is the CFO's responsibility and all the other business processes were not a part of it or rather were skeptical of accepting the reform and also looking at the seamless integration exactly what is it that is seamless integration in terms of the system um, as it has become evident that no single system can accommodate the change if there are other systems that are working together with this main system, which is um, the core financial system, how are they integrating? Are they integrating seamlessly? And then I will look at the backbone of um, the M score business reform, which is ICT infrastructure, including the hardware, software, connectivity, and, and, and et cetera. And also what are the current um, ICT infrastructure challenges and that are still impending the successful implementation of this reform? Uh, also looking at the governance structures in municipalities and provincial treasuries that are set up to support this M square reform because um, national treasury did not just uh, push municipalities or rather throw them in the deep end to swim all by themselves. There were governance structures that were set up to support them in ensuring that they are, implement they are implementing this reform and they're implementing it successfully. And also for any transition or change, there has to be change management uh, that can factor success or failure municipalities. So what is the process to institutionalize? <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, is it safe to say, apart from being a business reform, MSQA is a major in innovative solution in running this business reform in municipalities? in the new dis dispensation of the local government in South Africa. So those were the questions that were posed and that is uh, what we will be looking at um, in today's presentation. Um, now, looking at um, the background of MSCOA, this is a constitutional requirement for local government budget and financial reform. And it is based on the constitution of South Africa According to section 216, subsection one of the constitution, it, it states that the national legislation must establish a national treasury and prescribe measures to ensure transparency um, in expenditure control in the sphere of, gov of governance by introducing GRAP. So there was GRAP that was introduced by the Office of the Accountant General, also uniform expenditure classification, which is the standard chart of accounts or the general ledger and uniform treasury norms and standard, which is MFMA, we all know, um, the regulations, the circulars um, and all the guidance um, that is provided by national treasury. Also, uh, section 168 of the MFMA states that the Minister of Finance acting in concurrence with the, um, with the cabinet of the local government must make regulations, um, among other things, any matter that they may prescribe and to facilitate the enforcement or, of the administration of the act. So in the introduction of, of MFMA, which laid the foundation for local government reform, it included the development of a comprehensive reporting for the system for local government. So basically this is where 
MSCOA is not just a reform that um, came out of Norway. It was based on the constitution. It was based on all the other legislations that I have just mentioned, which necessitated that municipalities must, um, must implement the reform that was um, promulgated uh, by the National Treasury. So in 2014, that's when the Minister um, of, 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 of Finance regulated MSCOA and um, they, 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 they told all the municipalities and in, which includes their entities that they need to comply by the 1st of July, 2017, which is a long time from now. All the municipalities were to comply. And I can safely say at this point that all municipalities have complied, had complied by the 1st of July, but it is just the level of um, implementation now of the reform, uh, it differs. Now, the regulations, they, they provided the standard um, national and uniform recording of transactions because at that point, each and every municipality, because of different systems, they were um, rather budgeting, they were transacting, and they were reporting on, 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 different, um, or, or on, on, on different systems. And now it was cumbersome for um, national treasury. And in terms of also benchmarking municipalities reporting, um, it necessitated that there must be a, a, a standard, that the chart of accounts must be standardized for all the municipalities, which are using uh, different systems across all systems to ensure that there, there is uniform recording of transactions. Importantly, this reform is a business reform and it impacts on several business processes across units. I will talk to the uh, business processes in the slides to come, what those business uh, processes are and the importance of them. I've mentioned when I started that this is not only a finance reform um, that must be implemented by the CFO and their finance teams, it is a business reform which includes all the other business processes of the municipalities. Uh, MFMA circular number 80 articulates the business processes and the minimum system specifications that must be embedded um, in the system, that is in the budgeting, planning, and IDP module for all the ERP uh, systems. Um, this is a circular that um, was issued out some years ago uh, which articulates what um, the system should entail and how those business processes must be linked to the specifications of the systems. And at some point, I will talk to that uh, in the slides to come, that I think in the next two years, circular number 80 will be uh, regulated so that everyone complies and it is enforced. Now, we are going to look at why is, is, is it a business um, reform? Why is this not a finance reform, um, which is M-score? I'll look at um, the system functionality. So National Treasury, Treasury looked at systems and said, this is, these are the functionalities that the systems, each system of the municipality should have. And these business processes should link to the functionality of the system. We have got 15 business processes and I've broken them down into um, um, business processes that will be applicable to each functionality. For example, the general ledger. General ledger, it must um, encompass financial accounting, project accounting, costing and reporting, treasury and cash management, grant management, Meaning not only um, you will be looking at just the transactions, but what are the processes um, that are involved, for example, grant management to ensure that the general ledger is complete. Hence, it is important that the system should have that functionality for these business processes to uh, actually function properly. And then we've got billing. On the billing um, function, uh, there is revenue cycle that is billing. There's land use and building control. There's valuation role management. There's customer care. There's credit control and debt collection. So in all that cycle of, of billing, 
uh, the system should, or rather the municipality must have all those business processes to ensure that the billing functionality is complete. I will not look at the expected, I'll be sharing the presentation, I'll not look at the expected design features um, of the system. However, it is just important that this all links together for the system um, to function properly and also the municipality to ensure that its business processes are aligned. We've got supply and chain management and inventory and stores. The applicable business processes is the procurement cycle. Um, which, which includes supply chain management, it includes expenditure management, contract management, and accounts payable. This is very important, and it is so important that this system should have these functionalities so that there is not at any point that the municipality is transacting outside the system. If, for example, the, the supply chain processes are not followed, were not followed on the system, everything was done outside, then you get to the point of payment, paying through the bank. Um, even it will also affect the audit process where there will, um, there will not be any audit trail to follow up on, on what the processes were. And um, the legislation that is applicable has been followed um, in the right order. Um, asset management, full asset life cycle, including maintenance management, real estate, and resource management. Um, very important also that the full asset cycle from if the system is being used properly, they can be able to just draw that uh, report from the system and, 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 and submit it. At this point, there is a new, um, one of the new newest circulars that we issued out where municipalities now are supposed to submit their asset register on um, National Treasury Portal. And what is important that their systems are on point and that their systems are compliant with this, um, for example, the circular 80 is that we are uh, towards the process where we are also giving access to the Auditor General that they've got access to go straight to the National Treasury Portal and get those reports themselves that the municipalities are submitting to us. Hence, it is important that uh, municipalities at this point, they are working towards ensuring that they are implementing the business processes um, correctly, because by the time um, Secular 80 is being regulated, they need to be ready. Um, at this point, I want us to look at what should municipalities have in place. I've spoken to the fact that they were to comply by the 1st of July 2017, and now we are at 2023. What should the municipalities have? By now, they should have acquired, uh, we have spoken about the importance of, of, of ICT in the implementation of MSCOA. It is one of the core things that should be there. They should have acquired, they should have upgraded and maintained their hardware, their software, their licenses that is required um, for them to be uh, MSCOA compliant and to remain compliant. So at this point, if they have acquired for, excuse me, for example, their hardware, they need to make sure that if they do need to upgrade it to ensure that they are compliant, they constantly upgrade, they need to renew their licenses, they need to upgrade their software to ensure that they are always compliant. So it was not a matter of saying uh, by the 1st of July 2017, we did uh, procure, for example, a, a hardware, but they need to make sure that they are moving in with the times and um, their 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 software is 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 at a good um, a standing. Also, they need to budget, transact, and report on all six um, regulated M score segments. Um, before MSCOA started, they were only transacting at two segments, but MSCOA introduced six segments, which is a whole topic for um, another day. But at this point, municipalities should be budgeting, transacting, and reporting on, on six segments and directly 
on the core financial system. I've mentioned before that nothing should be done outside the system. Everything should be done on the system so that by the time um, for example, for their monthly report, if they have to submit their monthly report, it's just a matter of a press of a button and they are able to draw their reports and submit directly to the local government portal. And also the fact that we are stressing that municipalities should be doing everything on all their transactions should be on the system. Uh, we want we alignment that whatever transactions that they are doing, for example, uh, during the year, those transactions are linked to their budget. They're not um, doing any transactions that have not been budgeted for and that they are reporting correctly. <clears throat> and lock down the budget that has been adopted by the council uh, on the core financial system before they can submit that adopted budget, which is um, original budget standing for ORGB data string to the local government portal. So before the budget can be submitted to national treasury on the local government portal, they must ensure that they have locked the budget and the budget that they have locked, it should be the budget that has been adopted by the council. Hence, we are saying everything must be done on the system. We want one version of the truth and not different versions where there is one that was done outside the system. Now we are trying to go back to the system to, to, to make corrections, nothing of that nature. Also close the core financial system at the end of the month as required in terms of the MFMA, uh, section 71, before submitting their monthly data strings to the local government. The system should be closed so that they don't, after system has been closed and they had submitted information that information is used uh, by different stakeholders. Now imagine if the system is not closed and there are transactions that have been passed through, the information that has been submitted to the local government portal and what is sitting on their system will be different. Hence, you know, we do not want to see any variances between what has been submitted and what the municipalities have in their system. They need to generate the regulated schedules, which is uh, schedule A, Schedule B, and Schedule C, uh, A being the budget, B, um, ad adopted budget, B being um, the adjusted budget, and C being your monthly um, submissions. It should also be directly, directly um, drawn uh, from the core financial system. At this point, municipalities should have appointed a suitable qualified system administrator and the required IT securities are in place. So for this system to function properly, there should be a caretaker for that um, financial system, a system administrator who is able to keep up with everything that is um, going on. Is the, system, um, is the system operating correctly? What are the challenges um, that the municipality is having as it pertains to uh, hindrances to the implementation of, of, of MSCOA? Where a municipality does not meet these minimum requirements, there must be a roadmap or rather an action plan that should be put in place to address these gaps. So we have detailed what um, the municipalities uh, or rather where they should be. If they are sitting down and looking at themselves, seeing that they are not at that level, then there must be an action plan to sit down and say, this is what we do not have in place at this point. And what is it that we are going to do to get there? Does this require a budget? They sit down, they budget for it, and they put timelines so that they can be able to track where they are in terms of the implementation. Um, I will look now at uh, seamless integration between systems. I've mentioned that um, Treasury saw that uh, at times it is not possible um, to have one system. However, if the municipality has several complementary systems to cater for business dif uh, different business needs, then M square regulations require that the system um, of financial uh, management and internal control may not apply methodologies of that data mapping 
or data extrapolation to provide for the um, segmented transactional uh, data strings at a transactional level above um, as explained um, in the next point. Now, what it means is that if you've got, if municipality has got several systems, there must not be any data extrapolation, there must not be any mapping or manipulation of information from that system to the core financial system to ensure that uh, the data from that system to the main system is integrating. It must provide for a full seamless integration between these two systems, that is um, the subsystem and the core financial system representing the general ledger. Um, and at the third party with a direct impact on the general ledger. Uh, for an example, uh, human resources, payroll, third party system, billing, um, um, asset management system. So between those systems, I'll make an example, um, asset management, there must not be any manipulation coming from that third party system to the core financial system being, being the general ledger. Seamless integration, I'll tell you what it means. It means that the third party system is able to transfer information in real time or at least daily to the ERP system by ERP system, meaning the core financial system, without any human interference, and that a municipality can drill down from the core financial system into the third party system, meaning there must not be any manipulation of, of system. The information draws uh, directly, excuse me, in real time. If, for example, one is posting um, a transaction on that third party system, it must go directly to the core financial system without any human intervention. Uh, the two systems should be able to transfer data seamlessly between each other without having to create files that are placed on a net network drive or other location. Maybe you take the, uh, a file, a flat file from this other third party system, and then you need to go and uh, put it on the network drive and try to upload it. That is not what we call um, seamless integration. Most importantly, municipalities must assess the cost of integration and duplicating functionality that is available on the ERP system. So there are systems that you'd find that they offer. There's a system on the ERP system, there is um, this system that they need, but they prefer to use um, a system which is outside the ERP system. Uh, hence this point of saying assess the cost and look at if it's not duplication of, of functionality between these two systems. When integrating systems, the general rule is that the system vendor of the core financial system provide direction in terms of the structure and content of the data being submitted from the third party. So there must be a communication between um, these two system vendors and the main system vendor, which is the one for the core financial system, must be the one providing direction and the structure of how the core financial system is to provide direction on how the seamless integration is going to work. There's a question that was um, um, posed saying, have all municipalities institutionalized this reform? Um, this is what I am going to detail at this point. All municipalities have mentioned this before. They have implemented, but it is just the level of implementation that differs from one municipality to another. Uh, we have looked at it and found that 95% uh, of the budget and section um, 71 data strings are being submitted to the local government database, but the credibility of the data, it needs further attention at this point. Um, we, we are focusing because that's where it all starts from budgeting. Um, they need to get it right. Municipalities, they really need to get it right. They are submitting, which, which is well and good at this point. And on a monthly basis, they are submitting and which is improving and improving as, as, as well as, as, as we are analyzing the data. But now what still needs further attention is the credibility of the data that is being submitted. 
Um, National Treasury and Provincial Treasuries have uh, had several meetings with all key municipal um, financial system vendors during the functionality um, available in the systems that they had demonstrated. And uh, most of the municipal systems available in the market, they do comply uh, with the system requirements of the m Square regulations uh, through um, those meetings. That's what we have determined. And through them, system vendors, uh, demonstrating what their system can do to the National Treasury. And there are several assessments that have been uh, performed by national treasury and provincial treasuries. And there was an independent audit that was performed um, in the previous years at 17 munis in the previous year at 17 municipalities, which indicated that a number of municipalities are still budgeting, transacting and reporting outside of the core financial system in Excel spreadsheets. And then they capture the information on the system at a later stage. Um, this is the, the finding that uh, we had received from the independent auditors when they performed the audit uh, on those municipalities that were selected, 17 municipalities. This is evident that um, uh, when the financial performance reported to, to council differs, it differs from the information that has been submitted to the national and provincial um, treasury at the high level of unauthorized expenditure reported by them, AG. So we can safely assume that because we there are these inconsistencies or there are, or rather there are these variances between um, what has been reported to council and what has been submitted to um to the National Treasury Portal. It is because of what I mentioned in the pre previous bullet point of municipalities using Excel and then capturing their budget at a later stage uh, on their financial system. When budgeting, transacting and reporting is done outside the system and captured at a later stage, the built-in controls in the core um, systems uh, prevent unauthorized expenditure are not triggered. So this is where you, you get municipalities um, transacting or maybe having uh, transactions that are more than what they had budgeted for, um, uh, having unauthorized um, expenditure to say. It is because they are transacting outside the system and it is not possible for them to detect um, or rather their systems, uh, they don't have the necessary built-in controls to detect those transactions from happening um, or before they can happen and they can um, kind of uh, stop those transactions. There must be a trigger which says this budget ha has been depleted and you cannot further on transact on this particular account because it does not have funds anymore. Um, one of um, also the key findings from the independent audit, and um, this is not um, the list that I have here is not exhaust, uh, exhausted of those um, key findings, but I have just selected a few a key um, findings from what the auditors picked, that there is poor understanding of the minimum system requirements and business processes that I have talked to earlier on, uh, which are stipulated in MFMA circular number 80. Uh, this applies to all stakeholders. Uh, another finding is that system administrators are not familiar with M score requirements. There's a difference uh, where one understands, for example, um, IT, but uh, municipalities need a system administrator, someone who is going to administer the system that has the necessary required knowledge of m -Squad. ICT policies do not include requirements and procedures which deal with remote access and third-party access, including security controls and the responsibility of, of the third parties. Um, another a uh, finding is that uh, there's inadequate ICT controls at municipalities. Often users are sharing profiles and passwords. Um, 
uh, which is uh, are not allowed to download illegal applications and override controls such as transacting in the system without the budget and correcting uh, closed periods. Um, meaning those uh, necessary ICT controls, they're not um, implemented. And also there are the policies, that there must be policies uh, that um, policies that are stipulating that. So those controls, that's what they found is that they are inadequate in municipalities. Hence, um, there are these issues that they are finding. There's lack of integration between M-score system modules and third-party systems. I've spoken to um, uh, seamless integration. They cannot run system solutions due to use of obsolete and out of support operating systems and databases and licenses not being renewed time timely. Backups are not regularly done or tested. Uh, this is one of, of, of the, the things that I've mentioned uh, regarding to municipalities having to prepare uh, roadmaps um, which detail what is it that they do not have and how they are going to address those issues and put necessary timelines to ensure that they are following up on that. And I will look at the reasons why municipalities have not institutionalized the reform. There's lack of capacity uh, on municipal officials to use the financial system. Use of the m Squad chart correctly, apply basic accounting principles and do balance sheet budgeting. At this point, um, we found out that municipalities are lacking capacity as it pertains to um, using the system. They're not understanding the m Squad chart. Uh, they don't know how to apply it correctly, applying uh, accounting principles. They don't know um, how to do balance sheet budgeting correctly. Hence, they are uh, most of them are more uh, dependent on, um, there's so much dependency on the system vendors. There's resistance to change from the pre previous financial um, management practices and adopt MSCOA and its transparency. We, um, we There's municipalities that still have those people that are resistant to change and they do not want to embrace uh, the reform fully because they are so used to uh, this way of doing things and they are not ready to accept the new way of doing things. There is The next one is deliberate circumvention of the internal controls uh, built in on the systems to dodge unauthorized expenditure and commit, commit acts um, of fraud and corruption. There's also budgetary constraints to upgrade uh, and maintain the ICT environment uh, which is your servers, hardware, softwares, updated modules and versions of the system and, and, and licensing. So municipalities, do, do they have budget constraints. Hence, they are at a point where they, and that's just one of the reasons why they have not um, yet institutionalized the reform. And there's connectivity issues at rural municipalities, uh, which impact on the use of web-based systems and the submission of data strings to the local government uh, upload portal. Um, also, the level of customization in the system functionality it required by metros and large secondary cities delay system development. Uh, the next one is municipalities are dependent on the system vendors, I've mentioned that, and do not take ownership of their system, uh, which is the data captured on it. Uh, Non-payment of system vendors due to contractual disagreements results in vendors suspending their support, which affects the institutionalization of, of the reform. So it is uh, on both sides, system vendor side and also on the municipality side. But it is very important that municipalities, they take charge uh, and they take charge of, of the implementation of this reform and not be reliant on anyone. <clears throat> However, the reliance should only be for support. These are the governance structures that um, are required. Um, I have uh, alluded before that municipalities are not just thrown in the deep end to swim by themselves, but there are governance structures that are there to support municipalities and 
also municipalities need to ensure that they have established um, those structures to, to, to support them in the implementation of the reform. Each municipality should uh, establish MSCOA project steering committee that considers the progress and challenges with the implementation of MSCOA in the, in the municipality. Most municipalities had, because they knew that uh, one of the circulars in the beginning of um, the implementation of MSCOA was that they need to establish these committees. Most municipalities did establish the committees, but after According to them, implementation was just uh, there up to the 1st of July 2017. And from there, those um, committees, they, they died a natural death. Um, but at, at, at this point, they need municipalities. We are encouraged, we do encourage them every time uh, we meet with them that they need to resuscitate this project. They are very important because that's where they get to discuss uh, their progress. That's where they get to discuss if they do have any challenges as it pertains to implementing the reform. Uh, this committee must meet at least quarterly unless the municipality is experiencing any implementation challenges, they can meet more often. It's not a casting stone, um, but they would look at what their challenges are and when uh, and how often would they want to meet to discuss the reform. This committee must be chaired by the accounting officer. If the accounting officer wishes to delegate someone, they can delegate a representative, but it is the duty of the accounting officer to ensure that um, this committee, which is Project Steering Committee, has been established for MSCOA. It must consist of representatives for all, from all business units as MSCOA is an organizational reform and not a financial reform. Very important that they establish this committee to ensure that all business units are involved. Imagine if they don't have um, the, the, the PSC. Now, who is going to follow up in all these business units? Because most municipalities, they leave it to finance to do everything. But if all business units are represented and uh, the, 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 the committee is functional, then it is easy for municipalities to embrace the reform. Also feedback on m -square implementation and those issues that are raised on the PSC meeting should be reported regularly um, at the executive committee meetings. And in these meetings, they need to ensure that m is a is a standing agenda uh, on, on this committee exco and also to the council. Um, as I've mentioned, most municipalities, they do have these structures in place, but they are not functional and they're not meeting regularly. Internal audit and council should also play an oversight role in m -square implementation to ensure that they are looking uh, at the implementation and, and, and looking at um, are they compliant? For example, internal audit, look at compliance. Has the municipality updated its policies to ensure that they are speaking to uh, the regulations of MSCOA to ensure that all the business processes are included and also council? Uh, is the PSC reporting to council if they are having any challenges? So municipalities, uh, they do have the necessary support structures that they need to establish from their end to ensure that they do comply with the MSCOA requirements. Um, in terms of the way forward, uh, I cannot um, stress this enough. They need to ensure that there's a roadmap in place to address those implementation gaps, and the project steering committees are in place and they are functional to drive the implementation of MSCOA in the municipality. They need to implement change management programs to facilitate the institutionalization of MSCOA as a business reform and not only a finance reform. Um, we, there, there are still those people that are resistant to change, but if there are those uh, change management programs uh, for, a, for MSCOA, it would make uh, things easy, it would make implementation easy uh, and, and a smooth process for the municipality. Municipal officials and relevant stakeholders should be capacitated in MSCOA and the use of their respective ERP system um, uh, 
Towards this end, National Treasury is offering MSQA e-learning. There is a web-based self-learning course that is hosted by the National School of Government. It is offered at no cost to, gov to government um, officials. National Treasury is ensuring that they are assisting municipalities to uh, be capacitated in MSQA. Um, there is there are technical master classes as well for municipalities and system vendors to ensure. Uh, I've mentioned that we are still looking more on credibility. Yes, municipalities are submitting, but to ensure that they are submitting credible information, we are hosting um, and facilitating these technical master classes on a monthly basis uh, for municipalities and their system vendors. Uh, to ensure the credible data strings are submitted and it is hosted through SIGFARO. Also, no payment required. It is offered at no cost by National Treasury. Um, also, the National Treasury, I've mentioned uh, when I was talking to Circular 80, it will regulate the minimum business processes and the system specifications on Circular 80 in the next two years. We are, that is why we encourage municipalities to ensure that from now on, if they were relaxed, that they look at their uh, business processes, they look at their systems and ensure that they are in compliance with Circular 80 before it can be regulated. Um, that is where I am going to pause. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Sistina. And uh, as you are concluding, uh, there is a comment uh, that just came through uh, from Alseo Putabo. I'm learning. Wow, what an informative session. And my lady, you are teaching well. I, I can't agree more uh, with that uh, because one of the things that we do with these recordings, uh, they also go to municipal officials, municipal executives, uh, even the students uh, that we have uh, in our database. So that's what I was going to say myself to say the, the, the way you've uh, articulated it. Anybody who gets, uh, I'll say, because it's technology, I can't say hands, uh, ears uh, or eyes and mind and heart to this recording on MSCOA, uh, that person will learn a lot. Uh, and thanks a lot for that. Uh, and to our audience, uh, I see we're already engaging. Uh, let's continue doing that because later on, uh, Ustina will, we will rejoin the panel uh, just for us to look at some of the issues or areas that uh, she spoke to, uh, specifically the findings and uh, what is still, I would say, going wrong uh, in many of our municipalities. But uh, in going to that, as Tina, and as you prepare perhaps uh, for you coming in later on, uh, I see the governance structures uh, that uh, I would say in some municipalities, uh, or not even going to municipalities, looking at the role of treasuries uh, in supporting the reform, but also going to that municipal level. The, I think at some point, uh, there is a need to shift, or not only shift, uh, to look at the role that the portfolio committees uh, in various provincial legislatures can play specifically on the oversight, because currently it shows not all is going well. Yes, some municipalities have embraced the reform, but let's try perhaps to bring those portfolio committees on local government or, or quota uh, for them to oversee uh, the, the implementation of the reform, because th th there's one thing that is correct, and it can never be wrong. National Treasury resets. I'll say laws and regulations uh, came up with uh, the reform, uh, but I think implementation uh, is at a municipal level. And I think the moment all the structures uh, that are supposed to be functional uh, and being part of this journey uh, need to, to, to come on board because it still shows for me 
we still have a long way to go. As I welcome uh, further uh, my, my other panelists uh, that we've invited, we've got Upo Tembelani who will come in and, and I like the findings uh, because within the findings, uh, the, the, the specific ones uh, that really deal with ICT issues, uh, the policies uh, that do not include requirements uh, and uh, the controls that are in there. As you come in and also just your own experience uh, having operated in the municipal uh, sphere, uh, what is it uh, that uh, we really need to do better? Uh, we really need to do more uh, to bring uh, this reform uh, to actual reality, because at the end of the day, it contributes directly on how municipalities function. If we've got functioning municipalities, uh, sustainable municipalities, uh, directly that then says we can experience uh, even better service delivery. Uh, just a brief about yourself, uh, and then you can just uh, start to engage with uh, what the system uh, uh, has put forward, uh, but more focusing on your area of expertise, uh, as we have also spoke earlier on, we can also even bring uh, the ideas uh, of earlier uh, for uh, our audience uh, to, to be exposed to. L let me give uh, it to you, uh, Honorable Sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, uh, Ms. Naki. I think I also agree. It was a very informative uh, presentation. And, and what I'm, 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 I'm very happy about is that at least we now know, together with Treasury, we now know what the biggest challenges of local government uh, are. And I think it's a, it's a matter of saying with the recommendations that have been made, when can we implement those recommendations? So, so I think we, we don't spend too much time in this conversation uh, repeating what has already been presented because broadly we understand what the limitations of, of, of local government, uh, we understand what the limitations are and, and we even know what needs to happen. So it's a matter of getting the institutions that are implementing uh, agents of this process or this transition to, to adopt and, and put timelines on what needs to happen. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Zinyan. I think just to introduce myself, my name is Tembelani Mapanga. I did work with, I, I have worked with municipalities, I've worked in municipalities for a few years. My first exposure to local government was the IT audit I did way back in 2001. So, so, so it's been a very, I've, been a, I've had a very, a close relationship with local government for the past 15 to 20 years. And, and I have and I have had an experience of working in local government as the head of IT at a district municipality. And some of the issues that are raised by Ms. Nagi in her assessment of local government, I think they are, they are, they are true and they do need a, a, a serious and serious attention. But uh, but Chair, before before we I go into uh, my comments. I just need to 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 raise something that I think maybe we may look at as well. If you look at the report that was pre, that the, the document that came through from DPSA uh, in 2019, I think it was around March 2019, if I'm not mistaken. The the report was that corporate governance of ICT in government has failed to deliver the expected results. And, and there, were, there was a letter that was circulated to all premiers indicating where the challenges have been. And there was a process that was initiated to review corporate governance of ICT. But as you, as you remember, Chair, well, in 2012, when that document was first developed and the framework was, the policy framework was put in place, it had, to, it had to exclude a local government because it was designed for national and provincial departments and not for local government. And then in 2015, a version uh, for local government was presented and, and adopted. The challenge that 
the, the challenge that we, we, we then experience is that that policy document was, was in 2012 and in now 2022, it was not reviewed in line with local government. I think that is, that is where some of the challenges come from. If we're going to develop a governance framework, a policy framework, that does not talk to challenges within local government, you will find that you will experience challenges. I think that is the first thing that as part of us looking at the way forward, we need to relook at that and make sure that we do not miss an opportunity of inputting in that document so that it talks to what local government is experiencing. The second part, Chair, I agree with Treasury and its assessment. We need to go to local government and start saying, how do we capacitate local government? You will find that a local municipality in a rural area will have a system systems administrator, or even some don't even have IT managers. But those are coming from the technical side, not from the business side. And how their understanding of the system is to keep the system up and running to protect the environment as much as they can. So that is the second one. We need to go back and say, can we agree to have a role of a business a business driven system administration so that they can drive the business side of, of system administration, not the technical side only. The third one, Chair, we are currently exposed as local government. We need to agree when and how do we protect? Do we protect the environment at a district level? Do we protect at local government level? Can we afford to, to invest in, in cybersecurity and security in general? around systems within local government, or are we saying that role can be taken by districts so that we protect the assets that we have? I think that is something that we need to look at. The last one, Chair, that I want to bring to the conversation. In, in, if, if you look at the conversations that are taking place across the globe, there is a view that within boards, you need to bring ICT expertise because as we transition into technology-driven organization into digital transformation. At a board level, there are decisions that need to be made. And, and without understanding and appreciation of technology and, and, and digital transformation at a board level, you find that you struggle to implement some of the changes that need to be affected within those. And institutions that have got that capacity at their board level, you see how they've responded and they've optimized value that is coming out of the, the technology transformation. And I think the unfortunate part within local government is that we do not have that representation at a council level, at standing committee level, level corporate services standing committee, which is mostly responsible for ICT. Uh, even, uh, even, even at the level of management, you find that ICT will have a technician, technician reporting to, uh, to corporate services and corporate services is not an IT a, a, a executive or IT experienced senior manager. And you find that this poor technician is then responsible to drive all of this. So, so there is a need for us to relook at, at that position in so that we are able to have the necessary capacity within local government. And if you've got capacity at council level, you've got capacity at, uh, at, at, uh, at, at the standing committee level, capacity at management level, then you are able to drive these changes. Over and above that, we are not saying change how you bring in the, 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 the leadership into public sector institutions, into local government specifically. But let us build up when, when, politi when politi our political leaders come in, let us empower them so that they are able to drive, uh, to drive this transformation. I think those are the few points that I wanted to take. But I take the points that are raised by Treasurer, and I think those are to the point, and we just need to make sure that municipalities are given an opportunity to implement the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. That was mouthful, uh, um, uh, and again, uh, uh, thanks once more uh, for being with us uh, this morning. Uh, because most of the times we, we always look at uh, issues, uh, I'll say uh, in a more conventional way, and forget uh, the, the, the ecosystem. Uh, and what we've just uh, touched on now, uh, it's bringing the ecosystem back. And uh, Osistina, when she was presenting earlier, she made a reference uh, to structures uh, that 
uh, ought to have existed, uh, structures that need to exist uh, to ensure that uh, the reform uh, comes into reality. And as you reflect on specifically uh, the ICT part of it, uh, linking it to corporate governance, uh, which is really the heartbeat uh, of a municipality, it then says, we've come far, but we still have perhaps a, a longer road to travel. Uh, but also bringing the conversation together is how do we then begin to travel this road together uh, as a collective? Uh, and to say together, it's various structures uh, because even in your input, uh, you've referred to a, a strategy uh, which was uh, even referred uh, to a, a provincial level in terms of provincial government, uh, linking to the issue of capacity building uh, that needs to take place. Uh, it came through in terms of the findings. Uh, you are also touching on that. As I've indicated, portfolio committees on local government or COCTA for an example, and the talk of skills uh, or, or capacity development revolution, that's what I can call it. How do we then build that capacity and support at council level? Uh, because we, we all know that uh, based on uh, reports from SALGA uh, and various entities that when it comes to the capacity of our councillors, which is, uh, you referred to boards as well uh, when you spoke, uh, because councillors and councils, uh, they fulfill that position of a board, but more at a municipal level. And they need to have that understanding. They need to have that support. They need to be capacitated uh, on this reform because if we talk of service delivery, and again, you say this reform is a business reform, not a finance reform, they are the custodians of service delivery. That is now the council and councillors. This is a tool uh, for me or an innovation or a solution that seeks to assist them uh, in their oversight uh, in provision of or, or delivery of uh, basic services. Uh, you'll also come in later, uh, um, because the question will be now, technology is advancing uh, at a rapid pace, uh, as you have uh, indicated. Uh, in terms of now building up or coming up with uh, risk management strategies uh, in closing the gaps uh, that we've uh, identified. Uh, but as we engage with that uh, and also continue to take the questions uh, from our audience, uh, let me allow uh, Omden, uh, we've been uh, in this journey together for some time. And uh, I, I think let me also acknowledge uh, the relationship that we have uh, with uh, the Center for Municipal uh, Asset Management, uh, which you are part of. Now, I want you to come in uh, because Sistina spoke about the issue of seamless integration of the uh, systems. Looking at the asset management uh, value chain uh, versus uh, this innovative reform, uh, which is digitized, uh, from that practitioner perspective, uh, what is your experience? Uh, and perhaps uh, what is it that uh, can we do better in ensuring that uh, asset management uh, life cycle itself directly translates to provision of basic services? But here is a, an innovative solution which doesn't seem to have landed, uh, I would say, uh, to not only municipalities, uh, but to practitioners as well, uh, and to a great uh, some extent, uh, uh, some of uh, the systems vendors. Uh, what, what is your experience uh, from the as asset management uh, life cycle uh, angle? Uh, over to you, uh, Omden. Good morning, uh, Zulani, and good morning, all the attendees. Uh, I didn't really prepare dress-wise to be to be uh, seen as well today, but uh, you know, it's very cold up in Hilton. Um, it's very interesting, the discussion. I've, uh, I've followed the, the whole EMSCOA implementation 
uh, right from the word go, uh, because I've been involved in the development of asset management systems uh, and therefore was very keen to ensure that uh, the systems can integrate or interface and there's a difference between the two, um, uh, you know, with the implementation of MSCOA. Uh, I've been involved with National Treasury as well to look at the, you know, to assess the, 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 the capacity of all the subsystems and specifically asset management systems uh, to provide uh, all the functionality, the business processes then, uh, and at the same time, also integrate seamlessly with uh, the main ledger, the main financial system. Um, and I've, I sat in on a on a uh, meetings up in in, in Pretoria for some time, uh, looking at that. But I have been involved in a lot of municipalities as well, looking at how they are doing in terms of that. Um, and I, from my experience, from what I've seen, uh, is that many municipalities and most of them actually have third party systems for asset management, uh, some very rudimentary, uh, not even close to the minimum requirements that an asset management system should have to, to manage all the, you know, the, the cycles of asset management. Um, and they're not, they're not able to, to, to interface even. Uh, I'm, I'm using the word interface, meaning that uh, the subsystem is uh, you will log in separately to that and you will then uh, at some stage update the information generated by the subsystem to the main uh, vendor system, you know, the financial management system, et cetera, uh, which is slightly different from uh, full integration where everything is uh, updated automatically all the time if you do any any transaction in a, in a subsystem. Um, that those those options are still out there, uh, but I, you know from what I've seen, as most municipalities are way off. Um, the the challenge that we have in in local government is that um, asset management extends way beyond financial management. It's not only about numbers. Uh, it's it's actually assets, uh, as uh, as the name would depict. Uh, they they physical. Uh, of nature, whether they tangible or intangible, it's it's separately something physically separately from from a financial transaction. So you have other uh, angles that you also have to accommodate when you're talking about assets. If you, uh, for example, you talk infrastructure, then you would have extensive uh, uh, geographic information systems with cadastral drawings and. Uh, and, and in some cases, most of cases, you will even have images of, you know, of these various uh, infrastructure items and even for movables. You also have, you know, images of that, uh, which is now, uh, I think, beyond where all the vendors are at the moment. They not, they, they haven't actually been able to, to, to ensure that all those aspects of asset management are also incorporated in the subsystems that they that they have available at the moment. So the, the the subsystems that are in use are mostly just of a financial management side, and even uh, some of the subsystems I noticed, uh, you know, cannot even do uh, a proper uh, physical verification of movable assets, uh, you know, with the, with scanning and uploading scan and doing that sort of verification and the condition assessments, et cetera. Um, so we, uh, I've, I've noted the intention, uh, you know, of, of National Treasury, uh, you know, to, to regulate uh, the, the, the provisions that were originally uh, recorded in, in MFMA Circular 80. Uh, and I must admit, I like the, you know, the MFMA Circular 80, a lot of the you know, the prescriptions in there is tremendous. It's very useful for, for asset management. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid the, you know, we, we're, not, we're not there yet where uh, the, the system vendors have developed their systems and extended it to such, you know, so that can actually uh, manage all the phases of, of asset management. Uh, a good example is on, on planning. The planning phase is most probably the most important uh, of assets, uh, I think a lot of our 
challenges now countrywide that we experience um, is, is due to the fact that planning was not done correctly and implemented uh, as and when it was required. So we, we need to attend to that, you know, with uh, sincere uh, intention. Um, and, you know, so that is, not, that is not available as yet in full. I think uh, from what I've seen from the system vendors, it's not there. Uh, a lot of it is, is also is of a physical nature. If you're planning, um, you know, to extend, uh, say, the boundaries or, uh, you know, build a new uh, development somewhere with lots of houses and you, there's infrastructure involved, et cetera. Uh, I mean, the modeling that needs to take place, you know, you're talking about other software now that that is not necessarily available to all the, you know, all the, the, the financial system vendors. So there's there's quite a lot to be done still before we can say, uh, okay, we are now where we you know where, where we can integrate and we know exactly what is required. Um, if you go back to the, the the provincial, the national treasury, the the circular in 2008, uh, which had explicit guidelines on the on the system requirements, uh, you know, as far as asset management is concerned, uh, and that is still for me the the blueprint. Uh, we've incorporated it in our practice guide as well. You know, that is really, if you look at that, it, it's, it's extensive and it actually covers all the aspects. Um, that is uh, a target still for most municipalities. I don't think, I don't even think the, the biggest ones have, uh, you know, have, 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 have that in, in their powers as yet to do all, all the things that are required in there. Um, so that is one of the aspects that's very important. And then something that Tina mentioned that I, I believe uh, is also uh, applicable to asset management. Uh, she mentioned the steering committee for, for the MSCOA implementation, um, that that is now, it, it was sort of at the time with the implementation, it was active and everybody uh, was keen to, you know, to, to contribute and make sure it works. Uh, and then it faltered off. And so, the, the full implications of, of IMSCOA and, and, and specifically the business processes as a whole, that hasn't been implemented fully. There's quite a lot of gaps like in asset management. Uh, the same thing with uh, uh, human resource management, a payroll management, that side as well. That's also, this is quite a, there's quite a, a huge gap in there, uh, specifically taking into account that we have the municipal staff regulations that came into effect last year that you have to implement and, you know, the establishment of your organic, all of that. There are quite a lot of physical things that needs to happen that, and the business processes are not covered as yet. But the, the 2008 guideline from National Treasury, and I might mention that uh, that was the last guideline that was compiled by National Treasury in combination with, at the time, uh, local government, public works, uh, Department of Water Affairs, all of them were contributed towards that. It's a very powerful document. Um, in there, they also promoted the establishment of an asset management steering committee. Uh, we now promoting an asset management committee because steering is now we we've we've implemented GRAP uh, and we've uh, accommodated you know all the challenges that 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 are that are coming with that as far as we can. But it's ongoing, and you actually need similarly you need a, a, an asset management committee that can also address things on a, on a monthly basis. Um, and I think uh, Tina also, uh, uh, you know, she recognized the, that you need the accounting officer involved. The accounting officer and the senior management of the municipality should be fully in charge of the management of, of all these various aspects, the business processes uh, within a municipality. And and I think that is perhaps something where we should start, make sure that we have the right managers in place. I know the legislation, the system acts has been amended now to make sure that we get the right people in place. But uh, th that I think is, 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 is very critical to making all, a success of all of this, the converse, conversion to, to MSCOA um, and the, the continuous uh, management of of not only the assets, uh, but, you know, the whole of the municipality. So having said all of that, 
I will uh, <laughs> I will hand that back to you again, Zola. Thank you. Oh, th 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 thanks a lot, uh, um, Dan, for, for for that input, uh, which also really emphasizes the point that yes, we've come far, uh, but we still have a long way ahead of us, uh, which should be expected uh, with uh, this type of uh, reform. And, and once more, if you are in a leadership position uh, in a municipality, uh, make it a point that uh, the officials, council, councillors, make time uh, to really go through this recording uh, given uh, the educational aspects of it, uh, but more so uh, how far we've come uh, with uh, this particular reform, uh, as we have indicated. Uh, as I will request um, my panelists now to uh, turn their videos on, uh, but just only keep uh, your mics on mute as we start now to, to, to engage. Uh, Sistina, there's also a question from uh, Uchanet, uh, which uh, I believe the regulation of uh, Secular 80 uh, seeks exactly to address uh, uh, some of the issues uh, because her question is, uh, when will Treasury re-evaluate uh, the integration uh, with third party systems? What penalties may be implemented? And again, as we get the Treasury always issued circulars as guidelines, but we know uh, the take and the view of some municipalities when it comes to circulars. And I believe uh, it's premised on that, uh, that now National Treasury has decided to regulate uh, circular 80 because a regulation uh, becomes uh, a law uh, in a way, and it doesn't give uh, anyone an option as opposed to the secular, as I've said. Uh, and again, uh, in addressing those and uh, probably coming up with uh, penalties, and yes, penalties, one can say penalties uh, are, are punitive. But if we look at what the business reform seeks to achieve, ultimately improving services uh, for our communities, perhaps uh, it might not be a huge ask uh, to go at that level. Uh, what's your take on that? And you can also probably, through inputs from uh, other panelists, uh, you might have uh, comments uh, or, or respond uh, to some of the issues uh, that uh, the colleagues uh, have raised. Uh, let, let me hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Che. Um, to answer this question, uh, Secular AT involves, it does, involve the integration because it looks at all the business um, processes. So integration of systems between integration of third party systems to the core systems, which is um, the, the ledger. Uh, the speaker um, that have, has just left the podium, Mr. Daniel, he mentioned the fact that um, at this point, there are systems that uh, specifically for asset management that are not even meeting um, the minimum requirements of what um, the, the asset management should be. Before we even talk about M-score, I'm, I'm just leaning more to asset management. We've got GRAP. We know the minimum requirements of the asset register. What should it entail? So before we even get there to it integrating to the core system, at least it, the, 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 that specific module for asset management, it should be up to scratch. So looking at the integration, right? So Secular AT, it entails all of that. And at this point, um, I mentioned that it is going to be regulated in the next two years. So I cannot um, say specifically what will be, uh, for example, what is it that is going to be done? Most of the times, I'll just make an example, if municipalities are not um, complying, you'd find that maybe equitable share is going to be withheld. But at this point, as it comes to, we know that 
it is going to be legislated and we are giving municipalities a chance to work on their systems to talk to, like I said, that the main system vendor should be the one driving the integration. And municipalities should make sure that they are taking charge. This is their system. They are paying for it. So they should be the one taking charge to ensure that implementation is taking place. And if not, they need to have the necessary channels. That is why we are stressing the importance of having these committees so that um, the council, which is the one that is charged with governance of the municipality, can know what to do if nothing is being done as it pertains to, 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 to compliance. So hence, a national treasury got to a point of saying, we are regulating. Secular 80 was issued many moons ago, and we can see that there has been a, a lot of years or rather a chance that municipality was given. But at this point, we are saying in the next two years, still, we are giving municipalities and we are working towards that. National Treasurer will not just regulate. I can assure you now there is going to be, I think someone mentioned that there is going to be consult consultation you know, with the other stakeholders um, that is going to happen before um, the, the, the regulation is issued out. I hope I have um, addressed the question. Thank you, Che. No, th th thanks a lot uh, about that. And, and again, uh, you are raising uh, quite a, a very important point on uh, the consultation part, uh, which I would also uh, request, uh, I would say, our participants uh, who are in this particular webinar. When that window of opportunity opens, uh, it's also open for, for you, uh, Janet, in terms of uh, relating to, 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 to the questions you posed. Uh, this is how I believe uh, we can also uh, influence uh, uh, those particular regulations to ensure that they actually address uh, some of the questions uh, that we have. And um, I, I saw your hand and I, I'll allow you to come in and also not forgetting uh, my earlier question I posed to you to say, uh, in terms of now, we see where we are and how we've come, the current challenges and the risk management component as it relates to the reform itself. Uh, what can we do best because without that element and uh, being in a position now to say, uh, this is the situation and uh, these are the potential risks because looking at the challenges, we need to quantify those risks as, as well. Uh, and most importantly, the slow pace, uh, what does it mean for, for service delivery? Uh, let me hand over to you, uh, and then you can uh, address that part as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. I think I think from 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 where I'm I'm, I'm sitting, I agree with Ms. Naki on some of the issues. There's a point that she she made to say municipalities must own the systems and the processes. The challenge the challenge again. If you do not have the capacity at the council level, if you do not have the capacity at the standing committee level, at provinces, at national, if you do not have the capacity at management level, if you do not have capacity at the technical level within our local, local government institutions, we're going to have a problem. Because I have worked in this space, uh, Ms. Naki, for many years. If if we can pay salaries, if we've got our emails up and running, if we can access the internet, everything is fine. Now, you, you have got a very junior official expected to drive IT strategy in the office that is next to the main, is next to the main exit of the building. Now, that person, some of them are not even at a supervisor level. Where they are at a supervisory level, they report to an IT manager or they report to corporate services. And you find that one, the person that is supposed to drive municipal strategy is not capacitated to do that. Not only with, in terms of experience, but in terms also of positioning. 
they are not, when strategic decisions are being made, that person is not there. Even if that person was there, but their level of seniority doesn't allow him to engage with the executives, to engage with the municipal manager, to engage because he's too junior to be taken seriously within public sector, within these municipalities. That is the first challenge. So when we are saying own the problem, we can own the problem as municipalities, but we simply do not have the capacity. I think that is where we need to engage and say, how do we provide such capacity? You've got local government CETA. Can we engage local government CETA to say engage with CPSI, engage with other institutions, engage with CETA, S-I-T-A, engage with them. Let us sit down, engage with one university. Let us develop a program. I saw one on digital transformation that was developed by NEMISA. Engage those stakeholders. Develop a program that will capacitate councils to be able to provide strategic leadership on technology matters within local government. I think that is only when you will now, because they now have an understanding of their role, their responsibility, but they are able to provide the political leadership and guidance. And then you take the second layer at a senior management level. Do we have a representation at that level? No, we do not as ICT, but we are still expected to provide this, this leadership. And yet you are not at a level where we are supposed to be providing this advice to the municipal managers, because municipal managers will be talking their section 56, and there's no IT manager with section 56. That is the second, the second issue. But overall, Chair, we need to say corporate governance of ICT was a DPSA responsibility. In 2022, a document was issued. A final draft of that document was issued and approved. But when you read that document, it doesn't talk to municipalities. It still talks to national and provincial government. And for me, those are some of the, because when you have a policy framework that should be driving the conversation, then that document should provide, should provide it, should be providing the, the framework where municipalities can now plug in or even be enabled to, uh, to, to engage. That is, a, that is a point that we need to make. So, so we need to participate in the review of the corporate governance ICT policy framework for local government, uh, because as it said, doesn't talk to us as local government. On the issue of integration of systems, I take the point. We need to start looking at integration of systems. But remember the danger that we have. We have institutions that are driven by vendor interests not institutions that are driven by municipal interest. You go to those municipalities, the guy is a technician, he's managing the systems. All he implements or recommends is what he's been told by one company or the other. And that is what is driving the thinking and the strategy because there is no other source or resource. We come as treasurer and you say, it's your responsibility. And the poor guy makes these decisions by engaging with the same vendors that are only driven by profit not necessarily by, uh, by, by the interest of local government. On the issue of, uh, of, of security and risk management, Chair, local government is at risk. Remember, local government is holding such a resource that is of interest to many stakeholders in the country and outside of the country. Now, when, 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 you, when you pull the amount of data that is sitting in those systems, and you analyze that data. There is a lot that is sitting there that, that, can, be, that can be sold in, in, in one transaction or the other. Are we building enough capacity in municipalities to protect that? And I have not seen a local municipality in South Africa that has got a role of an information security specialist because that role is very senior. You may find that it is equal to the level of the IT manager a, a CISO, but, but we do not have that capacity. So, so over and above all of this, we do not have capacity to even protect the same environment because of the structure that we have, the level at which the IT manager is pitched. In other institutions, we do not even have a manager. And when you've got a, a person reporting to the IT manager and you look at the salaries that are being paid there, you cannot attract and retain an information security specialist. Then we need to sit down as this as this platform in these platforms and start saying, do we then take that responsibility and make it a district responsibility 
and then the district can provide a cybersecurity specialist responsible for both the district and the locals. So it becomes a shared service because that way we can then be able to finance the cost of having a senior resource providing that capability. Failing which we can then say, let's have it at a, at a provincial level. Can we build capacity at a provincial level that will then support local municipal in terms of information security management? And it can be done. It's a matter of us making a determination of where we can position it and we can be able uh, to afford it. Lastly, Chairperson, we are faced with artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, more especially the generative artificial intelligence, we can see what it is doing. Now somebody can write, can ask the system to write code to hack your system. And we will use the best of the best because that's what AI can do. What is level of exposure that we have as local government? Are we in a position to, and for me, we have not even analyzed what it means. And, and, and what I would, I, would, I would sponsor in this conversation chair is that Treasury, Cocta, Salga, and, and any other stakeholder in the market, we need to start saying, what does this transition mean for us? So that we can start putting together a plan in place. And if it requires that we partner with private sector and, and, and start developing capacity, at worst, we can say develop capacity at district level so that that capacity can service those different districts and make sure that our, so that when we're saying, own these processes, municipalities. We're able to say there is a business system administrator who understand M-score and many other things so that finance and related services can run smoothly. The technical guy can focus on making sure that the systems are up and running. So, so when we do that, Chair, we'll at least have a framework that we can use to plan for the next five years and be able to meet our strategic objectives. Thank you, Chairperson. No, th th thanks a lot for that uh, input. Uh, I, I would have loved to for you to keep your, your, your camera on, just uh, that togetherness and oneness, uh, as I would also be requesting on then uh, in a short while. Th there are things that you are mentioning, and again, that it takes us to say as a collective, what can we do better? Because when you spoke of ownership of systems, the issue of capacity, you mentioned uh, the stakeholders and already the National School of Government, uh, Sistina, uh, the question could be, how can we use those platforms? As we have schools of that nature, how do they come on board to ensure that as part of uh, their operations and their curriculum, M score doesn't just become a systems issue, a finance issue, but uh, it's embedded uh, within uh, what uh, the, the School of Government is doing, like your DPSA, SIGFAROS, your SALGAS, as you've mentioned. We also have uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, which uh, we also partner with uh, as uh, Future Cities Africa, as well as the Municipal Edge to say, as we talk of, for an example, reviewing the curriculum, talking about uh, the capacity gaps, constraints, how do we, as part of that review, uh, even the current model of uh, local government, uh, there are calls for the review and revising it so that it's fit for purpose. How do we then in that process ensure that uh, this reform, this innovation uh, finds itself uh, within that framework? so that it's not viewed as by the way or in isolation. It has to be embedded uh, within uh, the, the, the reform agenda. Uh, Sistina, I see your hand. Uh, what I'll be doing, <laughs> because I'm also looking at uh, time, as part of your closing and uh, remarks, uh, you can just package your inputs uh, because uh, we are left with probably about 20 minutes and I would like to give Umtega Zuma Panga uh, also a uh, last bite. As I go to Omden, um, uh, having uh, been part of uh, the reform of Omden, as we've indicated from uh, the genesis of it, and uh, having practitioners like you uh, in these platforms, 
who have got institutional knowledge, uh, who must also impart uh, that particular knowledge to share uh, with, uh, I would say, those upcoming practitioners uh, within the system. Uh, because as I've indicated, uh, we are more leaning towards uh, at the closing. Well, what would be your closing remarks or your words of wisdom uh, to those who are in the system currently, uh, but most importantly, those upcoming practitioners, because if we talk of capacity constraints, how do we begin uh, to ensure that we develop that capacity? Uh, we start to put this business reform uh, on the table of those uh, who are coming, I would say, behind us, uh, for them to be able to own it, uh, to do things differently. Well, what would be uh, your, your words of wisdom uh, from, from that end? John, thank you, Zulani. I, I must say this is a very interesting discussion. But the points made by both by Tina and Timberlani is very valid. I, 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 I like it. Uh, uh, I think the one department that we don't have in here is Cocta, and uh, because Tembalani mentioned the, you know, the possibilities of doing things on a district level, obviously the district development model, uh, you know, can be very useful in that respect. Uh, I know a lot of districts are already using uh, service providers, you know, as a shared service within the district, uh, and and similarly, I believe that that can be. You know, a very good solution. You know, for for IT as well, because the the level of expertise that you require, uh, there's just not enough people in the country uh, of that level that can go around. You know, 200 odd municipalities, but you might be able to 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 be functional at 44 districts. You know, have the right level of expertise. So I think we we need to talk. Uh, you know, with all departments as a whole, uh, and I might just mention at this stage that. Uh, CMAM has entered into a memorandum of agreement with SALGA. We're working together with SALGA, uh, and the intention is to form uh, a national asset management committee uh, involving, uh, you know, COCTA, National Treasury, uh, the National School of Government, local government, CETA, uh, SIGFARO, you know, all different role players. So we can actually have a look at, at asset management and where that fits into uh, the total management perspective as such, uh, for one, but also obviously as far as systems are concerned, because uh, you know the proper systems is definitely one of the pillars of, of asset management. Um, I, I, my, I might mention, uh, it might be a surprise to you, uh, is that at the moment there is no specific course uh, by National School of Government in as municipal asset management. Uh, it's just seen as a subsection of, of supply chain management, and we are in discussions with them as well in that regard, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about asset management because I believe everything else relates to it. You talk about assets under construction, uh, you talk about uh, billing and, 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 and service delivery, uh, it's all related to assets and the management of assets. Uh, uh, the one thing that we seem to forget all the time is is the the, the 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 compulsion by the constitution for the social economic development of communities that is as important as service delivery and and that also relies a lot on on assets you know there must be the right assets must be in place there must be roads for children to get to school or for people to get to a hospital or you know there must be a uh, early childhood development centers, that sort of thing, you know, we, uh, th those are all the things that we, we seem to, to not really pay attention to. But uh, I like the discussion uh, and, I, and I think we, we need to become more proactive in making sure all, all departments are involved. Um, I, I know, I've, because I've worked for National Treasury, uh, I was involved in the MFIP project, I worked for GTAC for quite a number of years. So I, I know, you know, there's a, there's a specific perspective that you have, you know, and but it's not necessarily that it's uh, always in uh, cooperation with COCTA, for example, or the other departments. And I think that's, you know, that sort of filters down to the municipal level as well, where you, uh, and I think Temelani mentioned that, you know, that sort of uh, corporate is seen as the IT, but 
there are other systems as well. I mean, who runs the GIS? You know, is that now still corporate or is it the planning or the, uh, the infrastructure sector? You know, we, we, we need to make sure that everybody uh, works together in cooperation. So building bridges between the silos, I think that's, that's very important. And then making sure that we have competent people in the management positions and that we also continuously uh, capacitate them, that we make sure that there's, there's training for, you know, for everybody within management. I would expect the, 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 the engineering, the, the infrastructure manager to have quite a considerable knowledge of financial management. They need it uh, because a lot of the decisions are uh, business plans, financial, financial management plans as well. So we, we need to extend that, you know, knowledge going all the way we need the financial manager to understand the physical uh, attributes of assets, for example, of what can be done, what cannot be done, or or how to plan for it. I mean, that's not it's not normally your 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 CFO wouldn't have that capacity, wouldn't have that knowledge. Uh, and I fully agree. We should look at uh, you know how we can utilize uh, AI. Uh, I mean, there's there's already. Uh, there's lots of scary things coming from that arena now. You know, what can happen uh, to us? We will be taken over by the, the big computer. Big brother will take over. No, it's, we must ma make sure that we manage that. But, for example, I, I mean, one of the things that we, we, we're, not, we're not utilizing at the moment is uh, virtual reality uh, to use the tools that are already available there in building uh, models, you know, of developing towns and infrastructure and all of that, you can create that in vir virtual reality and, you know, uh, and then implant all the different uh, external sources or, or, or forces that can have an effect on that and see what, you know, you can, you can really utilize that to the best possible means. But we're still a long way away from there because we're still trying to make sure that our basic systems are, are working properly. Uh, I personally don't believe that you will have, uh, with the, the vendors that we have now, that they will have the, 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 the capacity to say, we will have a fully compliant asset management system that integrates seamlessly with the financial system. Uh, I do believe that the financial reporting portion of the asset management systems can interface, uh, you know, by digitally with with the with the ledgers and the financial systems but you cannot it's not possible to you know to make sure that all of that because the it's just the amount of data and i think Dembalani might know you if you talk about you know uh, geographical information and cadastral data the it, it becomes so big this that most municipalities you know they they don't even have servers big enough to manage all of that at the same time um, so we we need to look at the configurations and where it can be managed. And, you know, do we set up servers on a district basis as well, you know, to keep all the extra data, all that, you know, there are quite a lot of things that we can develop to, to make, you know, to get the functionality and the, and that, we, that we want, that we're targeting and to make sure that we can do all the business processes as best as possible. Uh, I, I come from a financial background. I've, I've been a, Sigfaro member since 19, 1988. So, I've, you know, that's my background in the field. <laughs> I see, I see, I, yeah, I think this perhaps before some of the people were born on this, on this, uh, on this chat. But, uh, uh, you know, that is my, that is my focus as well. That's where I've, you know, where I'm based. I know that the, you know, the numbers are very important. Uh, but, you know, we have to make, make sure that it relates to reality you know we, we i mean it is if you talk about assets or you talk about uh, human resources you talk about people it's also these are real you know there's physical things that happen you know this it's different it's, it's not just numbers uh, you know and and, and amounts it, it it goes way beyond that um, having said all that, I think uh, I can carry on all day. Uh, uh, Zolani knows me. I, uh, I, I'm very passionate about you know what I believe in, but uh, I hope that uh, that contributes a bit. No, th th thanks a lot, uh, Omden. Uh, and as I've indicated, uh, with uh, 
your wealth of wisdom. Uh, it's showing out now to say uh, you've been a, profi a professional, not only a practitioner uh, in the space of uh, local government. And thanks for that. Uh, let me uh, give it to you as you also uh, probably working towards wrapping up. But there are some of the comments uh, that have come through, but you've addressed them. But it's important also uh, to acknowledge uh, the contributions uh, by uh, our audience. From Hert uh, Swanepoel, uh, the, the, there was a comment that came earlier that was really uh, talking uh, about the systems uh, vendors uh, and that uh, th there is a need for the MSCOA committees to guard uh, against uh, what I can term municipalities not owning the systems not owning the functionality of the systems. I, I think uh, Hertz's uh, comment is more around that, uh, which then takes us again uh, to the issue of uh, the governance architecture uh, as we implement uh, MSCOA. Uh, and again, uh, the issue of the shared services, I think uh, the way you talk about it, you understand it and you are passionate about it, uh, as raised uh, by Unjabulo from the comments, uh, which again, I believe those are some of the things that we need to start looking at as we, I would say, redesign uh, how do we deliver or how do we operate uh, this complex uh, sphere of government, uh, which is being local government, because it's becoming evident now that decentralization is okay at a municipal level, but with the initiatives like the district development model, how do we then begin to look at those services that we know we've got scarce skills, uh, but those uh, functions uh, need to be existed, uh, in existence. How do we take those functions to a district level, even to a province, uh, some of them? Uh, because we know our districts, the capacity that uh, we talk about, which is the capacity constraints or challenges, our districts are not um, immune uh, to those uh, challenges. But in, in so, and Zabulo also raises a, a point on dead in terms of when we are speaking about uh, the asset management committees, even the digital revolution, uh, the digitalization uh, requires, I'll say, a new set of focus on what type of skills do we build for us to be able to build our municipalities. Uh, because it shows now that what Hurt was raising earlier on, if we were to develop a pool of skills, uh, build a capacity specifically in line with the reform itself, uh, I believe there are many skills that, as NSG has indicated earlier on, other institutions of uh, higher learning, uh, various departments, uh, how do we begin to build that skill set that will then absorb uh, the business reform and infuse uh, in the operations uh, of our municipalities? Uh, as you close, uh, Mkhlega Zwam, uh, Th th those, those are some of the things that I believe we really need to look at uh, and perhaps you're, you're parting short and also saying these conversations uh, need not to, uh, in fact, they must not end here. Uh, this is our idea that we talk, uh, but we take action. Uh, it will also be, how do we then become involved in these processes? Uh, Tad, uh, Tina uh, make, made mention of uh, the regulating of uh, circular number 18. How do we get involved in that particular process? Is it a medium to a long-term uh, plan uh, or process? Uh, but for us to be able on then to get to where we want to be, we need to start also influencing uh, those uh, particular regulations. And um, guys, let me give uh, over to you uh, and also uh, as part of your closing, uh, before I uh, give Elsus Tina the last opportunity also to reflect uh, and also for, for, for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think, I think, I think Chair, the, the, the presentation by Ms. Naki touched on the 
most critical challenges that will 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 have an impact on the discussions that we have. So we know what needs to be fixed, and she has made recommendations there that will that will allow us to achieve the set objective. But but there are a, a few additional items that we look at. For instance, the the the, the governance around it not only now from the point of the financial management, but from ICT as a whole to say, if you've got an ICT policy, uh, ICT governance policy framework that does not even talk to local government, then you've got a bigger challenge. So we need to one, go back and say, DPSA, let's sit down. Here we are as local government, you have reviewed the ICT policy framework and we have not integrated the challenges that we're facing as local government. I think that is critical because some of the issues, the structural issues that we're talking about will then come out of that policy framework to say, this is how a local government should be structured. If you remember the initial document that was issued in 2011, 2012, it spoke about ICT should be reporting, I think the paragraph was, ICT should be reporting at the same level as human resources and, fin and, and finances. Now, we, we then said, but you cannot have a, a head of ICT in a local municipality that has got 500,000 people or 200,000 people, because it will make business sense. Let us restructure that conversation and see how we can position it. But when the document came back in 2015, that entire paragraph was simply removed. Then you ended up with one municipality having IT reporting to communication. In another municipality, IT reports to HR manager. In another municipality, they report to head of corporate services. And, and, and you then find each municipality placing this function wherever they feel like, because there is no guidance that says, this is how critical this resource is, and it should therefore be sitting in this office. Some IT managers are reporting to the MM directly. Now, now there are those things that need, and if you've got a policy framework that is, is talking to local government, then all of those matters would have been discussed. So there is a need for us to go back and say, DPSA, Salga, Copta, let us sit down together with Treasury in the office. Let us have this conversation. What should we do with this animal? We know that this animal is critical. We know that the future depends on how best we position this function. Let us have a conversation. Let us bring in other stakeholders. Let us finalize it. Then everything else will flow out of that because now we'll have a policy framework that we'll be working on and that policy framework takes into account all of these matters. I will come to, to what Om Dan has raised around GIS. There's an institution in the Western Cape that has been established to support government institutions on GIS. I spoke to them about eight months ago. The gentleman that I spoke to said, Mr. Mapanga, we have been trying to work with municipalities to assist them implement GIS because we own and we hold the cadastral data and we can make it easy for them to implement these systems, but they seem not to be working positive working relations between local government and that particular institution. So I think, I think once again, even there, it's just a matter of alignment because the service is there and, and we need to tap into that and say to that institution, what capacity can you give us? Can we host in your environment? Can we establish a hosted environment at a district level? And they would have the capacity to assist us. Again, we need to talk to each other and make sure that that entity, which is responsible for GIS in the country, is able to come down and assist municipalities uh, uh, manage this resource. The next one, Chair. If you look at if you look at what is happening globally, globally we are talking about ESG, environmental, social, and government. And this has got serious, serious implications for local government because part of what is, is expected is for us to drive sustainable development. And, and it, it impacts directly on some of the things that we do as local government. When we are expected in terms of the, of the, of the, of the constitution of the five mandates that we have that are driving the ESG. But, but, but you see IFRS now developing the, the guidelines. And the question for me is, when that happens, and, and it has been coming for quite some time, uh, Chair, and, 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 and the question that we must ask ourselves is, what is the risk exposure to our institutions? 
if now our communities are being educated and, and our communities are now becoming active, what will then be of local government? Because those regulations and what is coming out of the, of the Reserve Bank, where they are now beginning to consider developing similar for organizations that are listed in the JSC. But what you will then see in the future, people will turn around and say, municipalities, you are responsible for in these areas. What are you doing? If you are burning 10 billion rand of diesel across district municipalities in this country, what is our ESG responsibility and what is the cost and the risk thereof of our citizen institutions being held accountable by communities because we are not doing what we are expected to do. So these are the discussions that share. At a, at a strategic level, we, we need to be positioning our conversation and, and there is material out there that we can start tapping into. I just thought I should raise that so that when those merchants, for instance, treasury, can start looking at that I for regulation to say if it is being approved in Europe, soon it's going to be a requirement in South Africa so that we can tap into uh, monies uh, and raise funds to pay for our infrastructure. And if those regulations are there, then our municipalities cannot raise funds in the public uh, finance system because we're not meeting those requirements. And therefore we should start now to start saying, what does it mean for us? And how do we position local government in South Africa? Do we have a plan, short, medium to long term so that we can align ourselves? And it, I think it's something that we can put chair as, as uh, for future conversations, but I felt that we must put it in so that ESG can be positioned correctly in this conversation. Thank you, Chairperson. You, you are quite touching on a very important topic of uh, ESG, um, and again, I think, as you say, as we plan for the future, uh, those are some of the conversations we, we need to start uh, bringing to the table, because you are correct uh, on the issues you are raising there. Uh, Sistina, uh, as part of your parting shot, and also uh, having heard from our panelists, uh just give us a, a summation from your end uh, and again uh, the positive contributions and inputs because i've seen you've been noting you've been making notes uh, i believe especially in your capacity uh, within national treasury uh, these are some of uh, the things that uh, you will start uh, thinking about, but also as we develop, uh, because we still have a long way to go. And that I think, let's understand. We've come far, and uh, yes, uh, we might not have achieved uh, what we seek uh, to achieve by the reform, but we know and understand uh, what are the challenges. Uh, uh, how can you then, uh, as you conclude, uh, just sum up the conversation and also uh, just uh, leave our audience uh, with your, your final remarks. Thank you very much, Che. Um, this has by, quite been, um, you know, an eye-opening conversation. And uh, from my side, there are so many inputs that I have dotted down. And like you have mentioned that there are things we need, I need to go back so that we can sit down and start thinking about them in incorporating to the implementation of MSCOA. A truth be told, I think all of us, when MSCOA started, we were, you know, quite sure and adamant that after 2017, it was all going to be done. And, you know, but in all honesty, MSCOA is here to stay. Maybe it, uh, after I have retired and I have even have grandkids, <laughs> yeah, we, we can say, yes, M score is done. And, you know, we are no longer speaking of, of M score. But taking from um, all the inputs that I have just received and, you know, the comments, I will start with the one um, about, you know, the system vendors. We, we quite encourage, even in our, a training a, in trying to capacitate municipalities and all we we also train internal audit to say this is your your duty you have got a, a duty to ensure that you are looking at the policies of the municipality 
you are also looking into the contractual issues uh, are the system vendors doing exactly what they are supposed to do so that they don't get to a, a situation wherein they, they've got, you know, um, one of, of, of the issues that I've raised is that system vendors now having to withdraw their services because they have not been paid. And from the municipal side, they are not paying because they feel like you have not met, you know, the, the requirements. So the also, as part of governance, the internal audit is part of, um, of the go governance structures. We also, um, you uh, made, I think, um, one made mention of uh, capacitating counselors as well. We also do train counselors. We went to um, Eteguini municipality, I think it was in March. Um, I was training counselors there on MSCOA and they were quite welcoming. I think at first it was, they were quite hesitant, but they even got to a point of saying, please come back because not all the counselors were here. There were so many new things at that point that um, uh, they were hearing, uh, particularly I'll make mention of the website that National Treasury has developed called Municipal Money. And I was telling counselors that you need to make sure that you are taking charge you know, you are playing your role uh, um, of overseeing the municipality because on this website, citizens can go and they can see everything, everything that is happening on the ground. They know everything. So if you go to the public and make promises, they can actually go and log in to see how, you know, their monies are spent and to just see the plan of the municipality, how the municipality is performing. And that um, kind of training was being welcomed and we had incorporated it obviously with MSCOA and trying to uh, capacitate them and um, giving them exactly what is it that they are supposed to do, what is their role in the implementation of, of MSCOA. Um, when I joined, I think back in the day when I joined um, National Treasury, they were only um, doing on face-to-face -face, uh, training. And I think um, because moving with the times and, and technology, and also I think the pandemic played a role in actually assisting um, National Treasury partnered with uh, the National School of Government. Um, there is MSCOA training where we have got, um, we have split it into two. There is MSCOA training for financial officials and there is one for non-financial officials of which counselors are included there. Uh, internal audit is included there and it is uh, for free it is offered for free but for those who do not um, who do not like or do not prefer online training they are welcome to request training so that we can do in contact training we also do such so national school of government there is m squad training and it is both for financial and non-financial um officials it was supposed to um closed by the end of March, but we spoke to them and we requested that they actually um, move uh, the, 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 the deadline um, for, for free course, actually, because we had requested that they, you know, include free seats. But now the course is still open. People can, and it's um, even after the free course, it is not um, even expensive. It is 300 rands for the course. Um, but municipalities at whatever level they are welcome to go to the National um, School of Government website and, and apply uh, for, for MSCOA. And uh, SIGFARO, we've also partnered with SIGFARO. We have got monthly um, webinars where we are putting um, municipalities and system vendors in the same room so that we ensure that the information that they are submitting, it, it is credible. And also for municipalities to be, to come up with their issues when the service vendors are there as well. We want them to be able to differentiate who is supposed to do what. And we come up with our stance to say, this is the responsibility of the system vendor. And this is the um, responsibility of, of, of the municipality. So that's basically what, um, what we are doing in terms of capacitating municipalities. 
And we would like municipalities to take advantage of these free courses that we are offering in trying to capacitate them. Uh, also, their technical advisors that are assisting municipalities, not only on M-score, also on, um, on other streams, revenue, fixed assets, in trying to in, incorporate it in one and ensuring that the municipalities are, are winning. Uh, that's, that's, that's basically it from the National Treasury side. Thank you um, very much, Chepesin. Let me thank you and uh, perhaps uh, National Treasury uh, for uh, allowing us to engage with you this morning. But most importantly, uh, our panelists as well, uh, Mr. Mapanga Mtlegazwam, uh, we've been in this together and we still have a long uh, road ahead of us. Uh, it was great uh, having you on then. We will forever draw from your wisdom uh, as we uh, travel this road uh, based on your expertise, uh, your experience, uh, will forever rely uh, on that uh, experience and wisdom. And, and of course, uh, to our audience, uh, and even those uh, who will be uh, accessing uh, this recording, uh, we say you can learn a lot. Uh, you can see that uh, there is a long way uh, to go. Yes, we talk innovations, we talk uh, digital solutions, uh, but it needs uh, collaborations. Uh, it needs uh, a coordinated uh, approach. And uh, to then, uh, at Future Cities Africa, uh, thanks to you uh, and the team uh, for really bringing us uh, this uh, or creating this platform uh, for us to be able uh, to engage. And of course, uh, our team at Municipal Edge, uh, we thank you for your dedication. Uh, this is Zolani Zonyane, uh, the head of editorial uh, within uh, the Municipal Edge. Uh, until we uh, interface again uh, in our to next topic, which will be focusing uh, on the recent uh, municipal audit outcomes, uh, be in the lookout of the communication via our social media platforms, uh, both at uh, the Municipal Edge and also Future Cities Africa where we will be communicating uh, those dates. Uh, please uh, join us, uh, participate as always. Uh, your inputs are always uh, valuable. Uh, thanks a lot. Until we see each other again next time.